welcome to our panel on the perils and promises of democracies in Southeast Asia in the aftermath of the US Capitol riots. Uh, my name is Sopal Ear. I'm delighted to chair today's panel. Uh, I'm an associate professor of diplomacy and world affairs at Occidental College in Los Angeles and the author of Eight Dependents in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy, and uh, the co author of The Hungry Dragon How China's Resource Quest is Reshaping the World. Uh, my next book is uh, a little off of Southeast Asia specifically, but it's titled uh, Viral Sovereignty and the Political Economy of Pandemics, uh, What Explains How Countries Handle Outbreaks. Um, this panel uh, was organized by Eve Zucker of uh, Yale University and the Center for Khmer Studies, uh, on whose board I serve, um, and the New York Southeast Asian Network, as well as fellow panelists Duncan McCargo, director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, uh, University of Copenhagen, and the New York Southeast Asian Network. I'll uh, take a few uh, moments here to give Eve a, a chance to, to speak a little bit about um, uh, New York uh, Southeast Asian Network. Eve, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to uh, thank our panel uh, who is here with us from all corners of the world um, to join us in this, what should be a very interesting discussion today. I'm very excited about it. And thank all of you for attending this, uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on, on where you are. Um, so this says, as uh, so Paul mentioned, this panel is being hosted by the New York Southeast Asia Network and also the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies. So um, I'm a member of the uh, executive committee of the New York Southeast Asia Network, and uh, we're very excited to be doing this event. And uh, just if you don't know anything about the New York Southeast Asia Network, we're based pretty much in New York, sort of. <laughs> but it started off with more trying to reach out and uh, connect people uh, who have interest in Southeast Asian studies together uh, to network and share knowledge and uh, engage in all kinds of uh, discussions and discourse, originally in the greater New York region. But now it's, it's gone well beyond that. It's very exciting what's, what's been happening. And we've been hosting all kinds of webinars, you know, especially since COVID. Um, and that's basically what we do. I don't want to take up too much time on this panel because uh, we've got a lot of interesting questions to talk about, and I look forward to the presentations. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Eve. Um, yes, and so uh, I certainly want to thank uh, uh, NIAS, uh, New York Southeast Asian Network, the Southeast Asian Student Initiative, and the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Um, so let's get, let's get right to it. I'll, I'll just introduce uh, a, a few words on the topic and introduce our experts. Um, and then we'll get right to questions. Hopefully at about the hour mark, uh, we'll switch over to audience Q and A. So um, uh, audience members, please use the Q and A function to uh, write your questions and, uh, and I'll read them. Uh, towards the end of the hour and, and, and pose questions to um, from, from the selections from uh, uh, those questions you pose to our uh, experts here on the panel. Um, so the attack on the US Capitol on January 6, 2021, um, on the day that the Electoral College vote that would establish Joe Biden as president sent shockwaves around the world. After all, the United States is you know a country that's supposed to have peaceful transition of power and this was really the symbol of, of, of quite the opposite. Uh, well, it was no question that the Trump presidency had for, for four years tested the strength of the US democratic institutions. The perilous brush with violent insurrection left many people around the world, including in Southeast Asia, questioning the strength of their own democracies against the force, uh, forces of right-wing populism, the rise of authoritarianism and increasing nativism. Um, this panel, will address the question of how the January 6th event has been understood within five different Southeast Asian countries with variable levels of democracy. In fact, some very variable given what's happened in them recently. Myanmar, Burma, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Uh, did the event serve as a warning or was it dismissed? Uh, did it spur the advocates of democracy to fight harder or did it encourage supporters of authoritarianism to clamp down harder on protesters. 
Joining us today are five experts. Um, uh, Bridget Welsh is an independent scholar and political analyst currently based in Kuala Lumpur. My regrets, Bridget, for having to stay up so late for us. Um, she is currently an honorary research associate with the University of Nottingham Asia Research Institute, Malaysia, based in KL. She is also a senior research associate at the Hufeng Center for East Asia Democratic Studies of National Taiwan University and a senior associate fellow of the Habibi Center. Uh, she specializes in Southeast Asian politics with a focus on Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, and Indonesia. Uh, Duncan McCargo, our co-organizer for this panel, is uh, director of the Nordic Institute of Southeast of of Asian Studies, I'm sorry, and Professor of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, he taught at Columbia from 2015 to 2019 and is a co-founder of the New York Southeast Asian Asia Network. Duncan's books include Fighting for Virtue, Justice and Politics in Thailand um, by Cornell University Press 2019 and Future Forward, The Rise and Fall of a Thai Political Party with Aniarat uh, Chara Rakul uh, NAS, NIS Press 2020. Uh, Lisandro Claudio, um, goes by Lee Loy, is an assistant professor in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, my alma, I might add, where I stayed for four degrees. Uh, so Cal is very near and dear to my heart. Lee Loy is the author of Liberalism and, and the Post-Colony, Thinking the State in the 20th Century Philippines. Uh, Caroline Hughes, whom I've, I'm very happy to see again since a conference she organized in Cambodia uh, several years ago that led to a volume to which I contributed, is the Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh, CSC, I have to look this up, Congregation of Holy Cross, Professor of Peace Studies at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Her most recent book is entitled International Intervention and Local Politics, uh, published in 2017. Finally, uh, we have Sununu M. Thine, uh, who is a visiting scholar in the anthropology department at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Sununu is a senior research scientist for the Foundation for Psychocultural Research, FPR. So welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, making this time available for, uh, for this panel. Uh, let's start off um, with a few questions I've teed up and uh, again, audience members, please post questions in the Q&A. We'll get to them uh, in about 15 minutes uh, after we, uh, we go through uh, a few set questions here that, that, I've, um, uh, that we've uh, already agreed with the panelists to think about. So um, to start us off, anyone on the panel is welcome to chime in. How far do trends in particular Southeast Asian countries in recent years parallel developments in the United States on issues such as political polarization, popular, populism, and the rise of a disinformation regime. This is a gimme for the Philippines because the connections between the capital riot and what's happening in the Philippines are quite direct. So for example, some of the figures are the same. Paul Manafort was one of Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos's campaign managers in, 83, uh, in 85, 86 rather. And at that time, he was already talking to US journalists who were coming to the Philippines to monitor the election, asking questions like, by how many votes do you think Marcos should win this election for it to look believable, right? And the other issue around the capital right, this is more direct, is the issue of Smartmatic. So as you know, Smartmatic sued Fox News and other people in the right wing, like Rudy Giuliani, for example, for spreading news about Smartmatic having a backdoor leading to the Democrats being able to cheat the election. Now, Smartmatic is actually the largest election provider, is the, is, the election, is the voting machine provider of the Philippines. In fact, we're Smartmatic's biggest client. And the rhetoric that Mr. Mr. Giuliani used, which is that Smartmatic has a backdoor that allows you know, the, the, the administration to cheat, that was an accusation that Ferdinand Mar Marcos Jr. leveled against um, the Liberal Party in the 2016 election. And speaking of Mr. Giuliani, by the way, Mr. Giuliani was the lawyer who failed to prosecute Imelda Marcos in the early 90s. So the ties are, the, the ties are quite direct with respect to the Philippines. That's why I want to, to take that question. Thank you, Lilo. Anyone else would like to chime in for their respective country? 
I'd like to to speak to a couple things. Um, uh, first of all, uh, eh, eh, greetings from Kuala Lumpur. Um, today is the is uh, Chap Choi May, Chap Go May, which is the last day of Chinese New Year. So if you hear some sh fireworks in the background, it's not bullets; it's just fireworks. Um, uh, eh, so what I'd like to say is that what we've got in the situation in the context of Malaysia is, and many other countries in Southeast Asia, is really deep polarization, a political polarization that exists. America exists in different forms with many similar parallels. The, uh, the role of ideology uh, and differences on the issues of, um, in the context of Southeast Asia, particularly on the issues of uh, secularism, but not only that. No. Um, we also have issues of race and issues of inclusion uh, that, that were paralleled in the US. And of course, we have issues about reform. And in the context of, of Southeast Asia, um, we see, especially in places like Malaysia, the, the old guard wants to hold on. And in some ways, January 6th event represented that. And, and six days later, so seven days later in Malaysia, on January 11th, you had the declaration of emergency rule. And so we see a situation where this polarization is provoking some condition, similar conditions. And it's being fed by the disinformation campaigns that were, spoke, that were spoken about, particularly in social media, that feeds basically conspiracy theories. So while local conditions in Southeast Asia are very different, uh, there are some very striking parallels. Wonderful, thank you, Bridget. Um, and and I should add that you know disinformation, of course, is in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes uh, the, the new laws that have been passed seem to be sometimes, in the case of Cambodia, situations where it's about stopping whoever you don't want to you know talk about problems in your country and uh, and silencing them with with laws, disinformation laws. But anyhow, Caroline. Can I, can uh, I just Sinanus? add something yes, on that? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I think, you know, one one thing that, that's been interesting, I, I, I have to say, I don't see the situation in Cambodia. Cambodia has experienced a, a sort of an authoritarian reversal over the past uh, sort of three to five years, depending when you, you date it from. Uh, I don't see it as driven at all by events in the US. But what's interesting, I think, is that um, uh, Hun Sen, the prime minister of Cambodia, has, has taken many opportunities to use... Um, either events in America or rhetoric by, by Donald Trump um, as, as a, a sort of a, a sort of a sort of half half sort of cynical kind of a gloss on on his own actions and and what to, to, to just speak to Sir Paul's point I mean there's been a huge crackdown on independent media in Cambodia and that was preceded by Hun Sen publicly sympathizing with uh, Donald Trump's um, concerns about fake news, uh, and so while I don't think it's you know it's it's, it's not just a, 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 a sort of copycat situation, but it's interesting that the Cambodian government has lost no opportunity to appropriate that kind of rhetoric to justify uh, to justify its own actions internationally. I don't think it really plays so much um, internally in Cambodia, but on the international stage, he was mimicking those kinds of comments in a quite interesting way. Yeah. Absolutely. Certainly an opportunist when it comes to justifying his actions in any which way. And of course, he was a big fan of, of Donald Trump as a peacemaker for the world. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, and I, I'd like to uh, allow anybody else to chime in on their country if they'd like to, or we can certainly move on to, uh, to the next question. Um, um, yes, just so in regard to Burma, I think in, in some ways over the last five years, it's been almost the opposite. Um, trend right up until the November election leading up to the coup and up until the coup. So you really had in Burma for 60 years, a great deal of polarization, uh, you know, in, in right after uh, the first coup in 1962, but certainly in, a, there, um, in 1988, what you had happen was you had really um, sort of this military elite that became that much more entrenched that much more separated out from the rest of the population. You had them forming sort of the civil society wing that eventually morphed into the Union Solidarity Development Party, uh, which is the political party of the, of the military. And then you had this opposition movement. Um, and, and you know, those were the, 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 the two main sort of political sort of contestations and entities. And, um, and then so between 2015 and 2020, and arguably, uh, you know, even starting around 2010, you actually had a somewhat of a societal level attempt to sort of reconcile 
in some ways, imperfect, but still somewhat of a, a you know, attempt to reconcile. And then um, well before the November elections, you had, um, you know, the military and the USDP, you know, even starting in August, um, you know, uh, start up this sort of Trumpian rhetoric of election fraud and how the, the possibility of how the November elections are going to lead to election fraud. And then, you know, lo and behold, you know, the National League for Democracy wins a landslide victory, their third. And well, you know, they, they started up again and, and this very familiar rhetoric. So I think um, in terms of the, and, and even in the events that led up to the coup, they first started by actually sending the USTP send uh, men of violence, they're not known as Swanashin in, in Burma, to the capital, to, to Nebidaw, to actually sort of have a, a violent insurrection there and were stopped um, by, uh, by the police officers who seemed to be siding with the NLD government at the time. Um, and that was the lead up to it. So almost like it was almost a Trump playbook that they were following. Yeah, it's leading by example somehow, right? Uh, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, all right, well, um, unless, unless Duncan, you want to chime in, um, yeah. I'll move on to, go ahead. Yes, yeah. um, I mean, as Caroline says, it's a little bit more complicated than US inspiring Southeast Asia here because there's clearly a, some sort of reciprocal inspiration is going on. And I was sitting in Princeton in 2015 telling my colleagues that Trump would probably get the nomination uh, and it, it could be worse than that. And nobody believed me. Uh, I'm not claiming that I'm really a, a fortune teller and most of my predictions in the past have been wrong, but I think it was because I've been following Southeast Asia that I was seeing what was going on in the US through that lens. And then the following year, we had the Anna Cerebralis of 2016, which for me began, um, Leloy will forgive my execrable pronunciation, but I went to this meeting de avance that Duterte had uh, the final night of his uh, election campaign. And I was sitting, I, I have to confess at the VIP stand that someone had taken me into uh, with this sea of people getting very, very excited about invocations of violence and Duterte announcing that all criminals should be thrown into the uh, Manila Bay behind Luneta Park. And the, I got a bad feeling about what was going to happen the rest of the year. And I, I feel like what was happening in Southeast Asia was in some way, a, a, for me, it was a sort of premonition. I then went back to the UK to, to vote uh, the, in a very important referendum that took place in June to remain in the European Union. And you know how successful that was. Um, but then we proceeded to see the, the outcome of the 2016 election. So having been following the politics of Thailand, which has been so intensely polarized since at least 2005, the, all these themes of polarization, populism, whatever that is exactly, and we can debate that rise, rise of disinformation regimes. This, this for me was coming from Southeast Asia and then as usual, the West follows. So things really start in Asia and what goes on in the West is essentially peripheral. That's what I've been trying to tell my students for years. Not everybody in a place like Copenhagen necessarily believes me, but for me, the center of the world is Southeast Asia, as Sukarno <laughs> said, focal point of world contradictions. And we saw those contradictions that then ripple across to the US capital beginning in places like Bangkok. But that's just my uh, perhaps perverse way of uh, seeing the world. Yeah. Well, we did see a Cambodian flag here and there at the uh, Capitol riots alongside some South Vietnamese Republic flags. But uh, uh, I don't can, know whether... I, <laughs> Go ahead. Please. Can I tack on something to that? I think one of the reasons why the Philippines in particular is a predictor for U.S. politics is because it's almost exactly the same system of government. Right? It's the closest system in the world, to the U.S. system government, except it's occurring in an elite democracy in a place where institutions are a lot weaker. So it's a kind of thought experiment. Do you want to know what the U.S. like, what looks like if it becomes a banana republic? I mean, it's the same structure. So, for instance, like, look at the way the Solicitor General of the Philippines under Duterte was behaving it was exactly the way William Barr would behave two years after. Look at the way Duterte has practically cooked the Supreme Court and allowed him to imprison his, uh, his opponents, like Senator Leila de Lima, for instance. That's exactly what Trump and McConnell want to do in the United States. And of course, I already mentioned you know, the, the, the specific incidences of Smartmatic, for example, pa Paul Manafort. And in fact, you know, I think Paul Manafort learned a lot of his dirty tricks while working for Ferdinand Marcos. So I think Duncan's absolutely right. If you want to understand the US, you really have to study the Philippines. I don't understand why people are comparing the US to governance systems that are so unlike it. Like the Philippines is the banana republic that can be compared to this banana republic. 
it. And we should be asking where else Paul Manafort has been operating in Southeast Asia, perhaps. Go ahead. <laughs> Could I add something to that? I mean, I, I totally take the point about um, the significance of institutions, but I, I want to also um, uh, suggest that there's something um, sort of more fundamental than that going on in, in, in the way that the global economy is functioning and, and some of the things that we've seen, some of the sort of social problems that are intensifying across Southeast Asia. I mean, you know, and, you know, not, not um, you know, to, to sort of going back sort of um, to the global financial crisis, possibly, um, you know, things like the, um, the huge displacement of people from, um, from land, uh, from housing uh, uh, that, that's occurred as the global economy has increasingly financialized the flow of foreign investment, speculative investment into land and property, um, kinds of developments in Southeast Asia, particularly in, in sort of Southeast Asian cities, but also, you know, land grabbing in, in, in the Southeast Asian periphery alongside the, uh, the commodities boom. Um, I think those sorts of things are also happening in America. I mean, you know, in the US, the, the housing crisis, the homelessness crisis, the, you know, the, the sort of disastrous um, uh, displacement of people that occurred after the global financial crisis. I mean, I think, you know, we, we can see the effects of, of these kind of economic challenges and also climate change, uh, where Southeast Asia is so vulnerable. So I think there's kind of underlying structural pressures that also are kind of, you know, that, that are operating in both places. And, and perhaps in Southeast Asia, you see the effects more immediately in terms of social upheaval, um, you know, because we're talking about countries that have, you know, less resources to fall back on less, uh, you know, less developed welfare and, and that kind of thing. But eventually those kind of um, uh, economic uh, challenges kind of wash back to the United States and they affect poor people in the United States too. Mm, the global economy in action. Um, well, before I move to my next question, I, I, I will say that, you know, the, the pollster activity the, of the Paul Manafort variety uh, ha, has been apparently, you know, happening in, in, in within Southeast Asia with, you know, Taxon recommending to Hun Sen, this Israeli pollster who would go on to give him, uh, give Hun Sen all these uh, wonderful sort of scenarios where if you remove one opposition leader, what happens? And what if you remove both of them? And the pollster was like, what do you mean remove both of them? But yeah, yeah, just run the scenario. What would what would your focus groups think? And then of course it happens more or less. So um, it's it's quite amazing. They they do uh, do referrals for one another in terms of, you know, this guy's good or whatnot. If, uh, if he can help you uh, figure out the next uh, crooked election. Um, but now so, let's, uh, so let's can, switch. So well, can yeah, I add something ahead. quickly? Sure, I just Bridget, wanted to, sort of, to speak to just something that was just to clarify. I, I do think that Caroline is right that the, you know, and the US it, it, events did not inspire events in Malaysia. They happened, but there are similar types of dynamics. But I think that the situation in Malaysia and in many other parts of Southeast Asia are driven by local conditions. But I do believe there are shared drivers beyond the economic issues that Carolyn talked about. Uh, you know, we've got a situation of, of failures of globalization, uh, where you have large sections of society that have not benefited from the globalization process. We've had really significant issues of inclusive governance or lack thereof, um, which of course uh, it, it takes on often in the case of some Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia, racial dimensions. Uh, and we also have situations where these elites are, are, are driven by their own interest to, to such an extent. And this is what happened with the Trump administration. The Trump administration allowed some of the worst practices to be able to gain traction. And so, the, and in the sense that in Southeast Asia, it provided, it, no, it reduced the checks on human rights on the, and, and, and push and pressures for inclusive governance. The broader conditions were put in place well before January 6th. It was four years of the Trump administration that helped to facilitate the conditions for what some of the things that are going on in Southeast Asia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let, let me let me switch a little bit the argument here by, you know, we've talked about how the the the, the flip side of the terrible example of of less than peaceful transition and obviously all of the negative things that have happened over the last four years under the previous U.S. presidential administration. And, and we've heard about some of the parallels, whether it's wag the dog, whether it's an enabling environment where, you know, obviously without the checks and balances, 
uh, leaders in Southeast Asia are more comfortable acting uh, in uh, unprecedented ways um, has has been a kind of maybe what there's been a kind of what what Pauliani would call a double movement. So uh, there's been a kind of reaction from the people. So alongside the rise of authoritarianism in, in, in the world and in Southeast Asia, there's also been a growing resistance seen in the numerous protests of 2020 and 2021. Um, what influence do global protests like Black Lives Matter have on civilian protests in Southeast Asian countries? And I, and I would say, you know, it's, it's basically the, 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 like I said, the flip side. So if you have the insurrection and the capital riots, you also have, I think, an example of maybe that more perfect union example in the United States trying at least to correct itself or trying at least to get to that more perfect union and how that's perhaps an example for Southeast Asian countries, Southeast Asian movements. Um, anybody wanna uh, chime in on that? Sure. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's always hard to track these things exactly, but anybody who's been following Thailand will know that there were an awful lot of student protests or student inspired protests last year and that they're continuing. We've actually just done a special section of critical Asian studies. Two of the articles are already out and a couple more will be out in the next few days, uh, trying to understand what's going on with those protests. And it's still really early days to say, but the more than 400 student inspired protests in two waves, uh, an, an early wave right after the dissolution of the Future Forward Party. Uh, so that takes us right back to February and March. And then another wave that begins on the 18th of July and peaks in October with over 120 protests. And they're national, they're all over the country. We've been hearing about the Bangkok ones in the news, but they're in almost every single province and concentrated in provinces with higher education institutions, universities. Uh, what's really clear is, to me is that there is a regional, if not global phenomenon of generational divide. Uh, Generation Z, people under 25, are digital natives who are accessing information online, internationally and globally. They are not respecting, or certainly these, these Thai students and young people are not respecting seniors and elders as sources of information. They're not expecting, respecting conventional authorities like national TV stations, government ministers, or anybody of this kind. They're intensely and utterly suspicious of all information channels, and they're finding out what's going on in the world through networks of like-minded people and through social media channels. And to that extent, they are certainly some of the, one of the groups, MobFest, a Sri Lanka university-based group that has been doing things like covering the democracy monument in fabric and staging all sorts of uh, protests that, that center on a lot of social issues, LBGTQ and ethnicity and so on have loomed very large in their aspect of the protest rather than the monarchy reform, which has been another side of it. Uh, they are taking inspiration from Black Lives Matter and other movements like that. But they're also taking a lot of inspiration from Hong Kong, um, which was a kind of model for these student groups. That, and they're now reciprocally inspiring and being inspired by uh, the Burmese protesters. So the Burmese protesters doing the three fingers Hunger Games salute, whilst uh, the Thai students are now out banging pots and pans in Siam Square. So there's this incredible complicated reciprocity. And really, it's not about physical loc location anymore. It's about generational shifts of understanding and notions of where authority resides. So there's an absolutely fascinating global phenomenon which I have been asking lots of people to give me huge amounts of money to study so far uh, I don't have the check in hand but I think trying to understand what is going on with digital natives generation Z and how it no longer matters so much what country you're in or where you're from and more what age you are and and you know what apps you're using and perhaps what drink milk tea you're drinking yes the milk tea alliances <laughs> we could also talk about that's another interesting phenomenon yeah indeed anyone else want to chime in Bridget, you've unmuted, so do you want to say something? Let, let that, let Sanunu first go first. Oh, Sanunu, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, so, so I, I mean, I just wanted to say, I mean, I agreed with um, what, what Duncan said, you know, and every social movement, even before this technological revolution had its distinct culture and its very particular set of features and these technologies of communication that they have at their disposal, even if it was just landline phones during 1988, will interact with, with all these other features. But I think two commonalities 
uh, that the civil disobedience movement in Burma and the Black Lives Matter movement has is that they're both um, th the first is that from from the from their inception really it is a continuation of a tradition right so it is a creative reworking of a much longer struggle um, and so there's this sort of connection that these contemporary activists have to really these these ancestors um, some of whom are still living, many of whom are still living in the Burmese example, um, so from whom they can sort of receive sort of this collective and individual wisdom. Um, you know, um, so there was this sort of previous generations of sacrifice. Um, so the, for um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, it's obviously the, the, the civil rights movement. Um, and the civil rights movement was very much, um, you know, founded and, and based and structured around the Black church um, in the South. Um, which was very much a face-to-face -face community uh, for the uh, civil disobedience movement. Um, it was the democracy movement, but even before the democracy movement, a lot of these, uh, many of these activists were descended uh, from the movement for independence against the British. There's a very strong uh, connection. They were directly socialized um, by these previous generations. And I think what's gonna be really different with what Duncan was describing with this new generation of digital natives um, and these activists, uh, this activism that's taking place online is that there's not this direct socialization, right? So when you had the Saffron Revolution um, in 2007, a lot of those are sons and daughters of activists from 1988. They were literally sort of, um, you know, learned in this very embodied way, uh, the sort of repertoires of resistance. They heard all these stories about the prisons. So, and, 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 and it's a lot remains to be seen. I mean, it's one thing to be tweeting and to clicking on things and, you know, photographing yourself or even going, you know, kind of putting your, yourself out on display with signs um, in the plazas, but they're really cracking down in Burma right now. And then, so you have, you know, these examples of individuals like the, you know, I work closely with the 80 generation. These are examples of, of young men and women who had these extreme experiences of political violence sustained over a very long period of time. And once, once these other, these young people in Burma who are protesting now, and, and they already are, encounter violence, um, not just even the brief interlude of violence, you know, in the, in the public squares, but being taken into interrogation centers, being kept in the prisons for long periods. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I, I think there probably is this sort of collective uh, wisdom that they can, they can gather from the previous generation. And I think the second commonality that um, the, the civil disobedience movement in Burma has with the Black Lives Matter movement is that really it's embedded in this really broader sort of global reality where black and brown bodies are not valued, right? Um, and, you know, this is true and, and that black and brown bodies are aggressed against um, and that are violated. Um, and this is true um, in the Burmese case, even though the, the aggressors are themselves, it's at the hands of other black and brown people and sort of what's sort of the ultimate sort of form of false consciousness, right? So sh soldiers shooting um, at their own countrymen. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, and then often also, you know, what's, what's overlooked that it, what's overlooked is that, um, you know, both for the 88 generation um, and for the Black Lives Matter, it's usually the bodies of black and brown men right, young men um, that are often targeted. So there were a lot of women targeted in 1988 as well, um, but very early on they were targeted for sexual violence and many of them dropped out of the movement, right? And so, you know, you had this sort of global focus on a female figure, Aung San Suu Kyi, and people always, you know, the entire international community really empathizes when, you know, the, the female body is evoked. Um, but um, so I think that that, that is something that's, um, you know, that, that both, um, the Black Lives Matter man, uh, movement and what's happening in Burma now has in common is that th th they're both these movements that are in reaction to the historical devaluation of the bodies of black and brown men and are sort of a refusal um, to acknowledge their inherent vulnerability. And, and that's what the, 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 the society is reacting against in part. Thanks, Anunu. Bridget, go ahead. I would say, I, I just wanted to say, I think you're correct that you have to everyone to speak about the generational dimension and the fact that, you know, you do see cross-fertilization of uh, common, common threads in, the, in some of the protests that are covered by the media. And in particular, you know, you do see among younger generation, gener generation Z, new expectations. I mean, they, they are much, they have, and they expect things in a very different way in some ways than the past, um, they, and more, more rapid responses. But I think it's important to understand that these what, protests in the media don't capture the range of protests that are happening in Southeast Asia. 
And I think that, um, you know, uh, there, first of all, you see uh, the protests that are happening in tremendous amount in localities over issues like land and over issues involving climate change. Uh, there has been a lot of local mobilization across the region. We also see uh, more conservative forces. Islamists, for example, pro protesting in Indonesia over the omnibus bill, for example. Uh, and they are, you know, they fit into this discussion of polarization uh, that we, we can see in the United States and, and in parts of Southeast Asia. We have liberal protesters and we have protesters protecting the old order, you know, old order as well. And I think uh, what's interesting is that they are all using digital space in very, uh, very different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, the one that we are, they are you know, we're, we're captured by the more uh, liberalizing forces, but, but don't underestimate the same protests and the, and the same mechanisms being used by protests that are actually not as liberal. Leloy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to react to the issue of generations because I think it's a, it's a very good topic to talk about. Um, the historian Tong Chai Winnie Chukul was talking about this recently. He was commenting on Future Forward and to a certain degree, a certain segment of Putai, and he said, these activists are not like us, they're liberals. Um, and I don't know if he said that with the sense of regret or if he was optimistic about it, but as the guy who studies liberalism and likes liberalism, I think that's a, that's a really good thing that they've sort of transitioned from Cold War era Marxism into a kind of practical demand for liberal democracy in the context of emerging authoritarian states. And I think this is how you would analyze the Milky Alliance more broadly, that they are in fact articulating kind of under-articulated, but nevertheless real liberalism. And I think that's why the Philippines is having a problem now with respect to the opposition, not just because Duterte has 92% popularity, but also because the country in Southeast Asia, which has you know, arguably the longest and deepest liberal, liberal tradition, now has a very weak liberal party and Duterte has turned liberalism into a, a kind of bad word. So, I mean, one thing like moving forward, and this might not have anything to do necessarily with Black Lives Matter, but a lot of the movements in Southeast Asia, especially in the context of Hong Kong, need to be inspired by a kind of liberalism because the threat to liberal democracy is quite direct. And you see this obviously in the case of Hong Kong with China, which is of course the promoter of illiberalism in this, in this part of the world. Um, I was going to say, uh, as to Bridget's point, the counter protesters are there, although in some places like Cambodia, they seem to be plainclothes officers who are just out there to stop whoever's out protesting or daring to rear their heads. I don't know if Caroline, you want to say anything about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in Cambodia, um, I think I think actually we we we're sort of on the kind of downslope. The I think the upsurge in protests in in Cambodia um, was you know eight to ten years ago, um, and particularly around the 2013 election, um, and and that was where you know there there seemed to be a real kind of hope that there was going to be change and and that there was going to be a more genuine um, shift to to democracy. And and I think you you know it's interesting that. Um, Recently, um, the the uh, CDRI, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, Institute in Cambodia, did a big survey of of youth uh, youth attitudes across the country, and they they didn't find you know they didn't find very liberal attitude. They found sort of reasonably conservative attitudes actually. I mean, it wasn't that this is a new generation with a completely different consciousness. But I think it's a generation that that um, is facing a specific um, set of problems. Um, I think uh, you know, in the in the sort of early 2010s, um, it was very much um, unions that were organising that protest, and so they fed into young people who had, you know, recently urbanised in in oppressive conditions in factories and so on, and 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 it was fed into a specific set of issues around that. Um, but those unions, I think, you know, to have, have been, you know, really uh, their ability to organize has been really emasculated since the since the crackdown. And actually, also, I think, you know, young people in factories over the last 10 years, the huge escalation in debt in Cambodia, personal debt, 
which is a, an incredibly heavy burden on those young people. And to some extent, I, I don't have evidence for this, but I wonder if it's crippling the ability of young people to, to sort of organize and, and, and have these kind of protest movements to demand particular kinds of um, political changes because they're so focused on servicing you know, household debt in rural areas. I mean, that it would fit right into some sort of Marxist narrative of keeping people down with debt and uh, basically emasculating them from protest as a result. In the US, maybe in an argument about mortgages, keeping people from protesting because they would lose their homes. Um, so, wow, well, um, did anybody want to follow up on, on anything that's been said? Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll move to, to add, the... Yes, I just go wanted ahead. to add Bridget. one quick one quick point. I think that, you know, protest takes many forms, right? And, and we've talked mostly about protest on the streets. But I think that, you know, when you think about the impact, for example, of the conversations that were caused by the Black Lives Matter, was that it, it is actually, it, it spurred on social media much more discussion. And we're seeing uh, open discussions of race in Malaysia and Singapore in, in very unprecedented ways. Uh, the, uh, even though the issues are still sensitive, there are, they're carving out space for that. And so the and, and there's also more discussions about policy issues uh, in addressing the issues of governance and the issues of inequality that I think that uh, are so are so pertinent. Uh, and, and so they don't necessarily take the form of, of go, people going to the streets, but they are also expressing uh, um, their protest in a, or their uh, frustrations in, a, in a, I think, a much more open and a direct way uh, in, in this particular environment than before. And somewhat part of that has been shaped by COVID. Uh, and part of that has been shaped by the fact that we see a situation where uh, the social media allows the space for some of these conversations to take place. Indeed. I'm surprised COVID only came up now, 45 minutes into our panel. It seems to be the, uh, the elephant in the room that, 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 that drives so much of what's happening behind the scenes. Um, all right. So uh, I know that, that uh, we, we, so we went from uh, sort of starting off with the riots, going into kind of global protest movements as a result of perhaps or inspired from Black Lives Matters. Um, I want to return us back a little to, uh, to direct impacts of January 6 itself. I mean, this, this, is, this is the biggest example of, of you know, um, in, our, in the history of the United States, I suppose, um, uh, something not going right uh, with, with a presidential transition. Although we, you know, we've had, we've had presidents uh, who lost and then didn't show up for their uh, for their uh, opponents' uh, the inauguration or left town or at four a.m. or whatnot. Um, but uh, but you know January six as 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 an event for Southeast Asian nations. And I'll try to combine it here with with another question, which has to do with you know what happened in in Burma exactly. I mean with this coup coinciding more or less um, within weeks of each other. Are, are there um, uh, effects from January 6th specifically, or can you trace uh, a, a line through from uh, that to the coup in Burma, for example? Or th is there a relationship between what the generals decided to do, perhaps, and, and, and what, um, what, we, what we saw in, in the capital? And maybe, Sununu, you could take a crack at that, but I'd love to hear from other panelists as to whether um, there's, there's perhaps something happening there. Oh, I mean, I, I think there, there's a there's a direct link, um, and in in Burma's case, there's 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 sort of sort of this sort of very very stark uh, direct link. Um, not not only in terms of sort of the sort of the the generals being inspired uh, by what what happened with with the um, election in, in the United States, but even in terms of um, Russian involvement. Which there's quite a lot of evidence for, and that I've, I've heard from multiple sources. Um, so some of this disinformation campaign that the Tatmadaw um, and the USDP started well before the November election um, had Russian involvement, direct involvement. Um, and so you know, pe people are always you know kind of pointing to sort of China's relationship with Burma, but it it, it was really in this case sort of um, the same type of um, involvement that the Russians. Um, you know the role that Russian the Russians played um, in the U.S. elections, both in 2016 um, and maybe less so in 2020. I'm not sure, um, but um, so so I, I think I think um, when when the USDP lost um, its election in 2015, which it was hoping that it had 30 years to build up 
um, all this institutional infrastructure as well, all its political opponents were in prison. They were hoping that they would win that election. When they did win that election, there was this deep desperation um, to win the next one and an anticipation that they probably won't, right? And then in terms of sort of that social media space, uh, that Bridget was was referencing. Um, there, you know, there was a period between 2015 and 2020 where um, the USDP, you know, having sent so many of its own abroad, you know, over the last 30 years to get PhDs to, you know, to 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 you know to to learn sort of the repertoires, you know, and the discourses of the West, um, that they were very very um, adapt at sending out. You know, there's there's this sort of of space that opens up on social media for, for resistance movements, but there's also a space for people sort of countering those discourses. So you have that even in Black Lives Matter where people start saying blue lives matter and all lives matter and you know, it, you know, you know, white lives matter and Asian lives matter. So you had that in Burma where this the USDP and the military were, was very adept at sending out these discourses rather than conceptualizing those in the democracy movement as being targets, uh, you know, persecuted uh, by the military as being targets of uh, violence over these many years, they were actually sending out these these sort of um, you know disinformation campaigns where they said, oh well, you know these people are elites, these political these these former political prisoners are elites, and you know the opposition movement consists you know we're not we're not the elite you know they're the elite they're the, they're, they're, they're they you know they, they come from sort of colonial elite and you know you know these these many things and I think what you have um, with the coup and this you know Generation Z coming in is really, um, you know, pe finally this sort of, um, the, this broader resistance movement learning to counter some of those discourses um, on, on social media. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Elite political prisoners, a new <laughs> concept. <laughs> Bridget, were you going to say something? I I saw you move there. Yeah, I just I want to say, I mean, I know that I know that this is the panel is focused around January 6, but from the perspective of Southeast Asia, they're not thinking about the United States. And I think it's very important for for people to recognize that the impact of Southeast Asia uh, on Black Lives Matters and everything uh, uh, that you talked about so far um, is pretty minuscule. Uh, you know, the, there are common pa there are common parallels and forces that are happening, but that these things to we should be careful not to see these things as interrelated and not to be so U.S. centric in understanding uh, the kind of these interactions. Um, but that said, I think there are some important points that, that we need to get across here. I think that, you know, people were people in the elites and the political classes who had time to look at these things, um, you know, who did follow what happened. Uh, and January 6th. And I think what for many of them, uh, that this was an illustration of, of the declining power of the United States in the region. And, and it really, I think this is a big shift uh, and that has been happening well beyond January 6th, before January 6th, but has, will continue. It, was symbol, it symbolized that. And, for, and I would also say it reaffirmed for many democracy activists in the region uh, that I've spoken to, the need for um, that to do things on your own. That you know that, that you can no longer look outside. Uh, you have to be, and they and people were doing things on their own anyway during the Trump administration and and and, and before that, and they would continue to do it. But I think it is a, it is a shift. Um, but I think also the January six events need to be seen more broadly than the insurrection. In particular, the arrest that happened afterwards, the issue of the impeachment. All right, and the kind of the broader response. And in some ways, I think that uh, they don't, they, this is the, re the reaction to the impeachment um, was that has also engendered some confidence that there is some sense of, of building, uh, of, of addressing some of the issues. So there are kind of shifts taking place. To the issue of Myanmar, which I, uh, I just wanted to emphasize, I think that it, in, in his keeping of this point that things are happening uh, outside of what's happening in the United States in Southeast Asia, the coup in my view started in August from my, in terms of planning uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and its roots well, go well beyond that as, as it was implied since the 2015 election. And the, the, if you look at how the, the, the planning of the coup itself was extremely well organized. The interesting thing, however, is that the game plan after the coup does not seem to be working as well. But we can talk about that later. Indeed. Caroline, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to say on this point about, um, you know, what, what sort of travels internationally about this stuff. And I think, you know, what, what, what it's, uh, and I, I agree that I think, you know, the events in, that are happening in Southeast Asia are being driven by internal tensions and issues in the, in the region. But, but what has been interesting, I think, is um, certainly in, in Cambodia, uh, a number of government officials have seized on um, the issue of election fraud, you know, which um, uh, we, we talked about earlier. And um, there's, a, there's a quote from, um, uh, a Cambodian official saying that the US can no longer be taken as a model of global democracy and then asking which country's elections are cleaner. <laughs> um, and, and I think what, what is interesting there is, I mean, back in the, in the sort of early 2000s, late 90s, I'm sure a lot of us were, were complaining about the, the limited form of electoral democracy that the US was promoting <laughs> in the Southeast Asian region. But actually those election, just, you know, the election itself, although it doesn't equate to democracy, it is it has necessarily been, it has nevertheless, I should say, been a thorn in the side of a number of governments, certainly for the Cambodian government over the past sort of 30 years since it was incorporated into the peace agreement. And I think, you know, the, the opportunity to undermine the kind of global legitimacy of elections as a way of, um, you know, sorting out issues of, of power, I think has been seen as an opportunity by a number of um, uh, politicians in, in the region. And, and that, that I think is something that may have kind of global ramifications. Indeed. I mean, I think, I think the conclusion could be that um, the actual insurrection itself doesn't, doesn't necessarily have a connection to what goes on per se, but uh, it, elites are inspired or look at that and use them opportunistically in ways that uh, obviously justify the outcome. Does uh, anyone else wanna add anything to this particular question? Duncan, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, clearly I agree with everything that's just been said. It's not, it's not so much a case of direct inspiration. The topic that's fascinating for me is the seizure of public buildings uh, and the seizure of legislatures, which doesn't happen that often. So I, in the book I just did about justice in Thailand, there's a court case where a group of protesters had very, very briefly occupied the lobby of the Thai parliament building. Um, they were actually from the so-called yellow side, the more conservative side. And if you look at the PAD protests in 2008, or you look at the PDRC protests in 2013-14, the only people who dared seize in the case of PAD uh, government house, the prime minister's office, or the interior ministry and part of the energy ministry in 2013-14 were the people on the conservative side because the red shirts would just have been shot uh, and, and they knew it. So it's a similar kind of parallel there. It's only people who think that they can actually get away with it who are going to take the step, not just of blocking an intersection, which is what the, the red side has had to do, but seizing a major public building. And that has very interesting parallels. So what we've just seen, uh, the hot news of this week is uh, Sotep Turks about former Deputy Prime Minister, the main lead of the PDRC protests, and three currently serving ministers in the Priyut government have just been given jail terms for their role in the PDRC protests of 2013-14. So these are the people who actually instigated the coup and are in the current government and are being put in jail for occupying major public buildings and intersections and causing disruption. Because the hunters that seized power in 2014 is the National Council for Peace and Order. You know, So it's very clear that signals are coming probably from the, from the top, from the palace. Anybody who's disrupted peace and order, at this point, we're just gonna throw the book at them. And I'm quite sure what happens in the US only encourages those signals to be sent to the courts that these people should be in jail because we don't want anybody else seizing any public buildings, even or maybe especially the people who are on our side. So that to me is the very, very interesting paradox uh, about the, the public building issue, which the 6th of January very clearly illustrates uh, in quite a number of these Thai mass protests. Right. Um, okay, we are at about three minutes before the end, the close of the hour. I actually have seen some questions in the Q&A that are very relevant to what we've been talking about, and I want to try to uh, weave them in. And then I, I think I'll leave the, the, the sort of the political trajectory question towards really the end so that uh, we can close our panel that way. Um, there have been uh, few, several questions that have come in. Um, the, the point about Putin, I think, is, is, is 
obvious, relevant in that, um, you know, Russia has has always aspired in the uh, recent uh, decades to, to kind of undermine the U.S. in whichever way possible, whether it's because of, you know, U.S. as, as, a, as a, an example of democracy, well, we, you know, we've got to show that democracy doesn't work. Um, so there, there's a question about, uh, can you address the underlying ideology of uh, neoconservatives, right-wing libertarian, uh, anarcho-capitalist, wild west, um, this is the author writing Laurent Strauss-Kraba, uh, uh, as this way of thinking goes around the world, uh, Russia, Putin in particular, plays an important role here, as well as Hungary and Poland for Europe. Um, so I guess, you know, perhaps more than just US, Southeast Asia, but now Russia, Eastern Europe, uh, as a kind of, yet again, example of, of where things might be headed in the region. Eloy, go ahead. Um, Duterte always says that Putin in Putin is his idol. But whenever he gets a follow-up question, he never answers it. He just says, well, he's my idol. I'm not sure if he knows much about Putin. I think he just views Putin as a kind of cipher for anti-Americanism. And he, that is his larger project, anti-Americanism. And I'm surprised, actually, that he hasn't used the capital insurrection to talk about how bad America is, because that would have been a gimme for him. Um, so I don't know if he's, if he's kind of given up on that project because it needs to be said that the last time they did the survey, which countries love the US the most, the country that ended up second was the US and number one was the Philippines. So the Philippines loves the US more than the, more than the US loves itself. So that long-term project on Duterte's part, I don't think it's done much, although there has been a slight uptick in favor. Since he became president, there's been a slight uptick in favorability for both Russia and China. Anyone else want to chime in on the uh, Eastern Europe Russia connection? Caroline. Well, well only only to to sort of say that um, you know I think I think Russia's sort of warming ties with China are of obvious direct impact on mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, because of China's huge influence there. I mean, I think Xi, Xi Jinping's attitudes are, are probably more directly uh, significant, um, but that the, you know, the, the increasing uh, sort of closeness between Russia and China, I mean, the, the sort of COVID diplomacy that Russia and China have, have been doing recently and those kinds of things, I think, you know, certainly um, that, that sort of prompts a, a kind of a, um, you know, inclination on the part of uh, authoritarian leaders in Southeast Asia to to sort of see themselves as this a, a sort of, a sort of blo a kind of anti-US sort of block possibly emerging, um, which incorporates Russia and and some some parts of Eastern Europe as well. I, I'm surprised we haven't talked about China until you brought China up. I mean, China, of course, this is China's backyard. Um, the Economist has a a big cover issue uh, on that, in fact, and and uh, I mean, I'm frequently referring to how China and, and Cambodia, in particular, the relationship has been, you know, nothing short of marriage for life. But uh, uh, you know, the demonstration effects of a of a of a Chinese form of governance on countries in Southeast Asia certainly has tempted and and the the financial rewards of of being friendly with China are undeniable, uh, certainly in the case of Laos and, and Cambodia, but as well as the debt and, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the trap that can, that can sometimes uh, proffer. Anyone else want to chime in on, 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 on that question? Um, Actually, there's well, another- Can I ask what yeah, you think go ahead. about-, about yeah. I mean, you know, I, I hear a lot of, of, of sort of quite racist anti-Chinese remarks in Cambodia. I mean, that, you know, that, that's been a wave recently. I mean, what, what, what do you, is that, is that like a sort of a populist movement in your view, that there's a kind of a, an anti-Chinese-ness that's, that's not just a, a sort of a, a resentment of, of, you know, particular development projects and is turning into mm. more of a kind of polarizing issue in the country. What, what's your view of that? Oh, well, you're turning the chair into a panelist. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I like to tell the story of, uh, of my first uh, visit back in 96 to Cambodia and, and, and meeting my aunt, uh, my paternal aunt. And we're ethnic Chinese and she's, you know, Tio Chow Chinese. And, 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 and she talks about 
the Chinese who've come up to 96. This is very early days still, you know, not the levels that we're seeing now. And she's talking to them, uh, she's referring to them as these goddamn Chinese everywhere. And can you imagine just how in, uh, you know, she's passed away now, but like in 2021 now with the, the, the numbers having increased by so much, a ethnic Chinese Cambodian just rejecting completely the, the kind of sense back in 96 of, of, of losing one's country. And, and, and for Cambodia, the, the, it's not just, you know, people coming in, but it's also your sand being exported out to places like Singapore to expand uh, the island of Singapore and making it uh, ever more uh, large. Uh, it's almost like the, the country underneath your feet being essentially taken away and brought to another country to make it bigger, to make that country bigger. So, so there's, there's, it, I, I think that there is obviously um, when, when the, the Chinese take over a place like Sihanoukville and, and, you know, the casinos are out of control and the gangster activity is uh, incredible. There's a, there's a, I'm sure a sense of like, we've lost Sihanoukville. We've lost this beautiful beachside city that was quiet and, uh, lovely for Cambodians to enjoy, and every every shop is now a massage parlor or a Chinese restaurant, and so it's it's like uh, you've lost a place, uh, a, a portion of Cambodia. But now, but then with COVID, I'm sure people were like, but now the business is all gone, and we need them back. So it's uh, uh, as with uh, Vietnam, perhaps Yankee go home, Yankee come home, and with the Chinese, perhaps a kind of uh, regret over the loss of of the revenues, but. But still, I, I agree, Look, there's nothing like uh, the sense of identity that is sort of threatened by, uh, by large numbers of people who come in high concentrations and occupy entire cities and feel as though, um, as though you know, you've lost something, you've lost, you've lost your country. Um, thanks for that. I'll put my chair hat back on. Um, there, was a, there was a question actually from the audience about um, the um, uh, what Southeast Asian countries, to what extent has there been regional authoritarian learning within Southeast Asia? And that's, that's obviously, you know, the, 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 the authoritarian leaders uh, taking notes from each other. I mentioned how, you know, tax and, you know, he was out of power, shared, you know, the contact info of a, an Israeli pollster. But, you know, there, I'm sure there are examples of, of, of learning by doing, seeing, and, and copying from, from all of these. I see you raising your hand there, Sununu. I don't know if you want to chime in. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, Bridget, go ahead. I want to speak to some of the issues of China and then move to the issue of authoritarian learning. You know, from the perspective of being in the region, I would say that these issues of debt trap and things, these are issues of the past. People in Southeast Asia are concerned with COVID-19 and the economic recovery and the economic struggle that they're in. And, and, and in this context, while China, uh, you know, they're not thinking about China as an authoritarian model, they're thinking about China as an investor and, and potentially someone who's going to give them cheap vaccines that may or may not work. Um, in the in that context, so I think that there there is a kind of um, you know there is a disconnect from this conversation about China and 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 then the great power, power competition between China and the U.S. and the and the experience of where and the way that people are perceiving China in the contemporary context, um, given what's happened in the in the crisis of the last year in the region itself, and I think uh, you know it is. Uh, clear that Ch that China has gained tremendous ground in Southeast Asian countries. You know, we're not talking about the Cambodias where, where China has been seen to capture for a long time. We're talking about ground like Singapore, like Malaysia, like Indonesia, um, through uh, vaccine diplomacy, but not only vaccine diplomacy, but also the fact that they're willing to spend money and the, the elites in power want that money for their patronage and for their greed and for whatever else that they say that they want to use it for, sometimes to help people, sometimes. Uh, but I think that we, we, we see as a situation where um, China's power has gained and the countries themselves are learning from each other, uh, from how to, and the old guard is learning how to stay in power. They learn not just from overseas, but they're learn, uh, as an outside of the region, but they're particular gaining knowledge from China in terms of how to use firewalls, how to manage the social media space. They're looking, uh, they're looking to 
um, you know, to each other in terms of the techniques that they're responding towards certain activists. They're doing, there's cooperating across borders and arresting activists in certain countries compared to the, the past. Um, yeah. And so there is, you know, a more cohesiveness to this old order that feels under threat. Uh, for, rightly so, uh, and and they and they are learning very quickly and adapting very quickly, uh, and and fortunately, so are the opposition to it. So that's why they're forcing them to have to do this. But I think authoritarian learning is taking place, and authoritarian cooperation is taking place in quite unprecedented ways. Indeed. I mean, I'm sure I, I, we know that certainly learning from Singapore, justifying disinformation laws because Singapore is doing their version of that, but he's got his reasons for doing it. And, and they're, they're implementing all these state of emergency laws from COVID and saying, you know, for any reason we can, we can suspend anything. And I, I, I would argue he could suspend anything if he wanted to without the law, but it's, it's still nice to have, I guess, the the appearance of the rule of law when uh, when you're trying to grab power. Um, anybody else want to chime in on on this authoritarian learning within the region? Leloy, go ahead. I think it was Fukuyama who mentioned who coined was it Fukuyama who coined the term populist international, which is in a way a kind of anachronism because populism is not internationalism; it is a kind of nationalism. Moreover. Uh, you know, populist international, of course, it connotes a kind of ideological coherence. But the point of populism is exactly to have no ideological co coherence, to kind of play it by ear, so to speak. So insofar as kind of conscious copying is happening, if it's happening, it's not signaled a lot because these people are not internationalist. But at the same time, I think these, these folks enable each other in certain ways. Um, especially in the context of ASEAN, wherein you weren't supposed to talk anyway, right? So you just like enable other people to do what they do um, and it's not going to happen. So I was actually surprised, you know, that the foreign minister of Duterte made a comment about the coup, um, uh, the, the Burmese coup. Uh, it was very un-ASEAN-like and I, I'm still trying to figure out where that came from. And I don't know what the thinking of Mr. Loxin was, but was that decent if hypocritical development. Thanks, Leloy. Um, there's a question from Asmus Rongbi. And by the way, the previous question was from, uh, I should give credit here, Jungai Jap on that uh, authoritarian regional uh, uh, learning. Um, so um, uh, Asmus Rongbi is asking, I, uh, could the panel speak or expand upon the varying class economic dynamics of the protests, uh, demonstrations, and broader organizing in Southeast Asia. Um, anybody want to take that up? Well, maybe I could say something about Cambodia. Although, as I say, I mean, I think I think Cambodia is 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 sort of you know um, perhaps. Um, perhaps the, the least, uh, um, the country that has the least sort of active protest going on at the moment. But I think, um, you know, what, what we've seen there um, is I think two, two, well, maybe three different types of um, protests going on. Um, and I think part of the, the problem in Cambodia is that there haven't, hasn't been really sufficient um, uh, alliance building between the three different types. So, I mean, for a long time, Cambod Cambodia has had this very um, uh, sort of quite elite led and very Western influenced NGO movement, which was established sort of specifically by international intervention back in, in the 90s. And, and that movement has, has sort of persisted. And I think it has been, um, it has been reasonably um, sort of influential and, and, and it has uh, certainly influential enough that it's now under huge pressure <laughs> from the Cambodian government and has been really the target of the Cambodians uh, sort of crackdown. Um, but I think there are, um, New, two new areas where, where there have been significant protest movements. One, as I mentioned before, is in factories, amongst factory workers. Um, but the other one is, is around environmental issues. And I think that's the most difficult one to really pin down. Um, and it, it seems to be um, uh, an, uh, well, a sort of a, a not, not, really a, not really an alliance because I, I see it as sort of fairly sort of amorphous and quite disorganized, but it's, it's certain kind of charismatic individuals who 
are um, advocating and, uh, you know, who, who present themselves as activists, they're often quite young, they're often university educated, which would make them quite middle class, but who go into rural areas and actually sort of um, interact with with farmers and get involved in land disputes and, 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 and really kind of um, try to bring the ongoing kind of simmering disputes over dispossession to a kind of a national consciousness. And those people also have been, you know, really attacked over the past sort of five to 10 years in, in Cambodia, there's been lots of assassinations and imprisonments of those kinds of people. Um, but but I, I find that that kind of group, that kind of young middle class kind of activist, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting sort of new development, I think, over the past sort of five to 10 years in Cambodia, but, but quite, quite weak and certainly being absolutely hammered by the ongoing crackdown. Yeah, they, they, they certainly, um, there have been also, you know, activists from Mother Nature doing these kinds of videos about, you know, sewage spilling into beaches and so on. And of course, for a while, it seems like, and they're very respectful in the videos of, you know, dear governor, please come and, you know, can you see that something's happening here? <laughs> and at first they were not getting arrested, but uh, but now it seems the the mass, mass sort of trials have begun and uh, and hundreds are now, uh, it seems uh, targeted for uh, for for you know punishment. Um, um, yeah. Anyone else want to say anything about the, this this class uh, uh, business of of, of um, protests and and demonstrations? Is there you know is there an economic basis? I mean, the Thai protesters they're not uh, you know they're obviously not friendly to the monarchy or well they'll say things like you know we have ten demands but. Uh, if you don't give us anything, it'll just boil down to one, right, Duncan? Okay, yeah, the, the monarchy question is a, is a big one, but uh, on, the, on who these people are, it's quite interesting. I mean, not being able to go to Thailand, I, I've had to rely more than usual on a couple of research assistants, uh, one of whom it turns out is from a very elite Bangkok family, and another one is from a very ordinary Northeastern family, basically the son of farmers. What's extraordinary about these two research assistants is they're absolutely and completely on the same page. They're getting all their information from the same social media sites. and They're all in the same networks. And these two people who probably wouldn't have been able to have a conversation with each other 20 years ago now have much more in common than they do with people in their own particular home area of different generations of political orientations. So what's interesting is that to some extent, this, the student movement does cut across class barriers to a degree. Of course, we are looking at typically more educated people um, and elite high schools to some extent as well, but it's not a straightforward class distinction. Or re and of course, class in Thailand is very difficult to separate out from region, part of the country, uh, the Northeast obviously being lower down, the pecking order, central Thailand and Bangkok being higher up, for example. Uh, the difficulty the, the student movement is having is precisely that it needs, if it's to stand the slightest hope of kicking out the present government, let alone reforming the monarchy, it needs a broad based alliance. And there is evidence of that to some degree. You've got other kinds of people who are very alienated by the economic problems that they're experiencing, partly as a result of COVID and partly as a result of the structural economic problems that Thailand was facing even before the, the pandemic. But they've been struggling to link up very successfully with people quite across all these class divides. But you do have people who were associated with the old red shirt movement who are very much of the same mind as some of these students and are aligned with that group. So the, the answer of course is that it's very complicated and very messy. And as usual, we don't have enough data and we don't have enough people going around doing surveys and finding out who these protest participants are. Uh, I'm watching the videos, trying to figure out how old they are and what they look like, but there's only so much. You, you, this digital ethnography is all very well, but YouTube, and wonderful though it is, doesn't tell you absolutely everything about what's going on. It's a very complicated picture, I think is the long and short of it, but it's not enough to say these are just basically middle-class kids who are driving the movement. Now it has become more diversified, but it hasn't reached the level of being a mass movement that straddles a wide range of social groups of a kind that would be a serious threat to the, the current uh, government. I have a question for Duncan. Go ahead, Lila. Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Just, okay. just on that, I was really fascinated because I, what's happening to Thaksinism, because I was talking to a couple of leaders of Putai and they're like super elite 
students from Assumption mm-hmm. Bangkok, and that wasn't my stereotype of some of a right. Texan follower. Right. So what and explains the, that? Well, uh, yeah, what explains it is that you know for years we've been we're absolutely struggling to explain Thai politics, so it's so confusing. So we came up with this yellow versus red explanation, which is very reductionist, and it sounds like all these poor people in the northeast are supporting Taksin, and every single person in Bangkok doesn't. But Taksin did win practically all the seats in Bangkok at one point, uh, so there are plenty of people in the elite who are still quote unquote red. They may be keeping a bit quiet about it these days since the 2014 coup, uh, but never has the yellow red distinction neatly uh, and simplistically explained all the people. Taksin had a broad alliance of people in his camp, including a lot of very wealthy sino thai entrepreneurs, for example, and their families, uh, and most of the police force and all kinds of other influential groups in different ministries and, and elements of the bureaucracy as well. So it's just it's just vastly more complicated than um, we've had to kind of summarize it in those color-coded uh, sort of tropes that, that, that pass for an analytical explanation when you're doing a 30-second interview trying to explain to somebody what's going on in Thailand. Yeah. But there are these there are these elite people, yeah. Can I add a couple of things here? I think um, I think Duncan is right that it's it's complicated, but I think there are two or three things that I would add to the mix. I think class mobility is really being an issue of some of the drivers that we're talking about. I mean, a lot of the the protests in Myanmar are not just about the military, but the mili- that the fact that the military is is taking away their hopes for the future and being able to aspire to, to to a different to move up the move up in terms of their projections for their lives. And I think that you know we're, we're seeing a lot of pressure, sometimes COVID related, mostly economic uh, re- uh, contraction related, in terms of uh, dry declining and contracting the middle class and also limiting social mobility in the context of a lot of countries in Southeast Asia. And I think this is part of the things that are underneath a lot of these protests and they cut across classes. I think the second point I would say is that I do think a lot of the political entrepreneurs in these protests are from the middle class and the ones that help to bridge um, and in terms of looking at the composition and, and looking at the leadership. Uh, not exclusively um, by far, but I think that it is important to recognize that they're helping to be a, a, a bridge in these types of discussions. And, and finally, I think that Southeast Asian countries, and I could speak from the perspective uh, of, of, say, for example, Malaysia, we, we, we see that they rely on um, the elites in power, rely on the, the lower classes for their they're concerned when the protest comes from that because that is their political base. They've lost the middle class and upper middle classes already. So it, uh, uh, now this is Southeast Asia. Malaysia is somewhat unique in this way, uh, but I think that uh, I think that it is interesting to look at the class-based politics of a specific country and to see how protests revolve around those sets of lines. And I think what what is going to be interesting for the trajectory moving forward in Malaysia is not where the middle class goes, but where the lower classes go. And they they contributed to why Najib was kicked out of power in 2018, because he lost support among those groups of people. And and I think uh, we'll see whether or not the current government is able to hold them on to them. And I and I think right now, with the economy being the way it is, um, there there are real uh, challenges ahead in that regard. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, Sununu, did you want to say anything about about the protesters in, in Burma? And uh, you know, I mean, uh, they're they're bringing a lot of hope for the possibility of reversing this. But I'm not sure. I mean, they're getting shot too and killed. But go ahead. Yeah. So, so when you had the 1988 movement, um, you know, you had you, it, it did start with these largely middle class, but not necessarily many who were also from the rural areas. But they were college students at. Yangon University, Yangon um, Institute of Technology, and um, you know, a, largely an educated class. But over 30 years, it really did spread where they built up these very, very significant structures through, throughout uh, the entire country. And then so when, when you fast forward 
to what's happening now, the reason they were able to mobilize so quickly was that they had all those structures in place and the same structures that they used uh, for the 2015 election and the 2020 election, right? And so you do have this Generation Z that's coming up and it's really interesting, someone I, someone mentioned sort of, you know, a new class of NGO, elite NGOs. And for Burma, that only came in um, you know, post 2012, 2013, right, with the Thane Saint era. And they were a completely different set. And they identify also as dissidents and activists and, you know, but a completely different class of activists and dissidents than, you know, individuals from the 88 generation or the, you know, the, the, the National League for Democracy. Because before that, you had these structures in place in society, um, you know, where people would covertly help the movement um, you know, help facilitate things, but you really had one community uh, that was connected to one another who sort of specialized in sort of extreme forms of bodily sacrifice because because the political violence was so extreme, because what you encounter in the interrogation centers and the prisons were so extreme. And you had this class or, or community of individuals who specialized in this, um, and, and, th and they're still there, but they're kind of aging out too, you know, but they were still there um, as a force now that they were able to put all these things in place and then you know and then you have this younger generation but you know it's going to be really interesting to see how this other class of uh, civil society leaders you know because there's a non-existent civil society in Burma before that this is like a sort of something new over the last seven years that's emerged who also identifies activism who are very um, you know um, you know who are coming out now you know in in, in large numbers um, we'll see how they adapt to that, to, to a political landscape that's riddled with violence, right, and riddled with trauma. Um, so, you know, um, so, so it's a, a, lot, a lot remains to be seen, but, but you know, in answer to that, uh, the 1988 movement itself, it's usually seen as, you know, the National League for Democracy itself is usually seen as Bama, as Buddhist, as being elite, you know, these are all the sort of the talking points of the military. It was incredibly diverse. And then when you, and even a lot, to the point where even a lot of these college students after they came out of the prisons actually married farmers and, mar you know, I mean, so I mean, the next generation certainly wasn't from that same class. So, so um, the, the, the movement itself was broad. I think it's opened it up that much more with the civil disobedience campaign because you have this other group of individuals who probably never bodily sacrificed, who never really came out for the protests before, but who, who were excited at all the opportunities that opened up post 2010. And they're, they're, they're coming out now as well. Fascinating. Well, um, I'll say that before I, I close out this, this session with, with the final question, um, that uh, I was on a panel where um, uh, the, uh, the Burma expert, <laughs> And the Thai expert were talking about how Thailand was less democratic than Burma because it had this 20, it had 33% required seats uh, by the, you know, the generals versus uh, Burma had 25% uh, seats. But of course, things change overnight. Um, all right, in the last literally five minutes of our panel today, I'd like to uh, to ask how did the development so far in 2021 on um, both sides of the Pacific or beyond, as we've traveled to uh, other parts of the world, uh, leave the various countries in the region in terms of likely political trajectories. Anybody want to, uh, and I think we should just go country by country if possible for, for literally a few, few seconds. Who'd like to go first? The future prediction about where this is likely to leave us in each of our countries. Well, if I can say something about Cambodia just briefly, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, 2021 has already seen the opening up of big mass trials, um, you know, a new law to um, require all internet connections to go through a, um, you know, a government Great firewall. Firewall, exactly. Yes, I don't know the technical term, but it's something bad. And uh, I don't see it. I don't see, I don't see things getting better in Cambodia unless um, there is some inspiration from, from Thailand and Myanmar. I mean, that is the one kind of uh, flicker of hope I, I see uh, in Cambodia right now is that maybe a, 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 not a contagion from the US, but a contagion from the region uh, might, might spark something to happen. But um, otherwise, I'm pretty pessimistic, I'd have to say. I, I would add that uh, the one thing that 
does seem unusual is that they, uh, the Phnom Penh did s uh, suspend uh, military exercises with China, which is seen as a kind of perhaps olive branch to the Biden administration that, you know, maybe we're not married forever and ever with China and uh, you, you can still come back into the picture, uh, the US. Um, Duncan, would you like to uh, go next on Thailand? Okay, well, I could very crassly promote our book about the Future Forward Party that I, I wrote with Anurat, my former PhD student. So we end with four scenarios. So if you want the scenarios, they're in the book. Uh, last year, when we did an event, Anurat was completely adamant that the one of the scenarios, which is the optimistic one, the gradual move towards progressive values and the future uh, triumphing was, was the right one. We were more optimistic in light of all those protests. What we've seen in 2021 is a very clear determination by the state forces uh, to clamp down on the protests. And that brings another of the scenarios, possibly to the fore, where you have you know, democracy in name only. You have a, an increasing hollowing out of representative institutions. We do have a process to revise the constitution in Thailand, which, which again was a source of some optimism, but the way it's going at the moment looks as though that process could be really captured by conservative elites and not yield the, um, the benefits that people were hoping. So. You know, you can still go either way, um, but it's not looking as good as it was, I have to say, uh, the past few weeks. Thanks, uh, Duncan. Re uh, democracy in name only keeps reminding me of another term uh, that uh, our former president used, uh, rhino, Republican in name only, but hopefully <laughs> none related. Bridget, would you like to go next? I think uh, Malaysia has experienced three governments in three years. And to understand this in the context of Malaysian history, the, the, this is the most political instability and change that it's experienced since independence. Uh, and I think that uh, we have a situation where emergency uh, has been declared. And while the king has encouraged parliament yesterday to open, uh, what, the fact of the matter is, is that the emergency is supposed to last till August. It may get, may get extended. We have elite contestation uh, and elite fragmentation and, and competition tied to patronage issues and, and ambition that, that have really held the country in paralysis and is likely to continue because of the instability within political parties, uh, and as well as the underlying uh, and competition between these elites. Um, and you have a population that uh, large parts of the population want reform and change. Uh, we've seen a, a swing back towards a more authoritarian pro, uh, tr trends, but you also have com contestation for democratic space. So where does this mean where it goes forward? You're gonna continue to see that contestation. Um, and play itself out. Uh, it is extraordinarily polarized elections and, and an electorate. Um, so uh, the underlying thing that I think will make the biggest difference uh, uh, is whether or not some of the elites leave uh, and, and pass on the scene or what happens in the economy, because the economy is going to be a driver of shifts from below um, and help to change and shift the balance of where things have been. Um, and we'll, and and I think right now it's been a slow process in the economy uh, in terms of the contraction. And so right now the country is in a situation of emergency, literally and politically. Thank you, Bridget. So Nunu. So, so over the, the, the last uh, uh, two, three weeks, I've been um, lobbying random Chinese nationals <laughs> and, and, my, and my, academic, my academic friends from mainland China, uh, you know, asking them why, why China doesn't intervene in a positive way um, in Myanmar. Um, and one of them uh, sent me a note saying, well, why don't we just invade? And I said, well, you, you know, invasion is too effortful. You know, I'm trying to f figure out sort of a win-win situation for China where they, they can actually, you know, come out as sort of heroes, um, you know, who, who actually helped, you know, um, you know, the, um, the Burmese state. But, you know, I, I think the, the, um, the key difference between now and I think what happened in 1988 and in the past in Burma is that I think the international community can play a much bigger role uh, because for the last 30 years, there has been this nonviolent resistance movement. Um, and in some ways it's succeeded, but you know, with this recent coup, 
it, it in, in in some ways there's there's almost there's almost nothing that you can do with this type of resistance movement unless there's some sort of broader intervention and i think that broader intervention um, is going to really be dependent on the cooperation that people inside the country because there is always a very separate space of contestation inside the country and then there is what was happening outside of it that's very that's a very stark um, something that's very strong in, in, in the minds of, of, of the Burmese and especially of the dissidents and the leaders of the NLD. But really, it's going to really require this sort of coordination and cooperation uh, with the international community to t come to, to, um, you know, um, to, to, to you know, to find solutions for what's happening. And, and I actually personally think that, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think a nonviolent movement is enough. I think that the Burmese military needs to be disarmed there has to be a broad societal level demilitarization, maybe at the level of what Japan and Japan and Germany encountered after the Second World War. I mean, I mean, so so and I think for that you need, um, you know, quite a lot of um, international cooperation, you need the UN involved, you, you, you need China involved, you need the United States involved, you need India involved, so you know, ASEAN involved. Um, so so it, it's, it's all up in the air. Thank you. Last but not least, Lee Loy, take us home. Yeah, I think when you look at Trumpism, it's actually been repudiated. It's just not obvious because by virtue of the exigencies of the Electoral College, gerrymandering, the rural bias of the Senate, Republicans still support him. But by and large, it's been repudiated. In the Philippines, Dutertismo has not been repudiated. And that's completely depressing for me because one would have thought that the bungling of the COVID crisis would have led to its demise. But currently, um, and you know, the crisis, we're, we're in the midst of the biggest economic crisis, most severe downturn in the economy since 83, since the Marcos years. Um, I think it's like 9% GDP contraction. And it looks as if Duterte is still going to hold on to like, at the very least, 80% popularity. I mean, he's starting in 92. So if it drops by 10%, he still has 82% pop popularity. Um, and so if there's any class solidarity in the Philippines, the ever evasive class solidarity that we've all been looking for, it is a solidarity that endorses the mass murderer in chief. Um, and we're gonna have an election next year. Um, and, it, and the number one candidate in the surveys is his Ivanka, is um, Sara Duterte, his daughter. Um, so um, no good news from the Philippines. Again, you know, we will have to find inspiration from other places, perhaps um, Thailand um, and other places where there is a milk tea alliance. Well, I thought her real name was Ivanka. When you said Ivanka, I was really concerned there. Um, well, join me in thanking every one of our experts for their insights and contributions today. I think it's been a fabulous panel. Uh, lots of insights, uh, both around uh, the insurrection, the uh, global protest movements, Black Lives Matters, um, you know, and and all of the the uh, fascinating interconnections, uh, not just uh, across the Pacific, but really global and within Southeast Asia that we've uncovered in this discussion. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Nicole. Fascinating yes, discussion. No worries. Nicole. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, everyone.